Fidelity. Fidelity is the motto of the United States Marine Corps. Semper Fidelis, or the abbreviated version Semper Fi, is a Latin phrase that means always faithful or always loyal. It means that no matter how hard the stuff hits the fan, that a Marine is going to be faithful to those that are fighting both beside him. Uh, he knows he's not going to turn around and see anybody heading over the hill in the wrong direction. He knows his buddies have got his back. They're always faithful Marines to those they fight for as well, meaning our country. The Lord wanted his children to be always faithful to him. Unfortunately, the fidelity that he sought was all too often answered with infidelity, lack of faithfulness, lack of belief. There comes a time, I think, in the not so distant future when it's going to be extremely important for God's children, especially the elect, to maintain the fidel their fidelity for our Heavenly Father. That day comes when the Antichrist is here. It becomes possible at that time for the elect uh, to commit the unforgivable sin. And if you are uh, an infidel, I'll use the term, uh, that, that's an unbeliever or one who is unfaithful to our Heavenly Father, you're by, very likely to be deceived by the Antichrist and for God's elect, that would be uh, comparable to committing the unforgivable sin. Let's begin our study concerning fidelity today in Exodus chapter 14. And we're going to pick it up with verse 1 as we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Exodus chapter 14, verse 1, and it reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. This would be near the Red Sea. This would be the second place of encampment for the nation of Israel. Uh, the first was, of course, at Succoth. Verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. This means that they have become bewildered in the desert. The wilderness hath shut uh, them in. Pharaoh's about to receive another lesson. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them, and I will be honored. This word honored in the Hebrew is kabod. It means to be heavy. Uh, that is to say, in a bad sense, it means to be severe upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. Chapter 5, verse 2, when Moses and Aaron first went to Pharaoh and asked that they be let go into the wilderness to worship the Lord their God, Pharaoh said, I don't know Yahweh. Well, <laughs> He's getting to know Yahweh. And it was told the king of Egypt, that's Pharaoh, that the people fled, that Israel had left. They took all their, their flocks and herds with them. I don't think they're coming back. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? We've lost our workforce. Who's going to make the brick now? And he, Pharaoh, made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Let's go get our workforce back. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. Israel doesn't have a trained army. 
They, they've been busy making bricks for Pharaoh's building appetite. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand. This means that they were defiant. They, they were confident when they left Egypt. That won't last for long. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen. A horseman you could think of as a horse and a rider. Calvary, in other words. And his army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Pihiroth uh, over uh, before Baal Zephon. Quite an army. And, and think again, Israel, they don't have any weapons. They, they've probably got maybe some tools, a hammer, an axe, maybe, a pitchfork, sticks. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. It won't be the last time that they cry out to the Lord. Many times that they cried out to the Lord, it was for the wrong reason. Let us go back into Egypt, into bondage is what they will ask. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us? to carry us forth out of Egypt. Belly acres. No faith in God. You see, it was God's plan that they were going to the promised land. He told them, I'll go before you. I'll defeat the enemies. I'll go before you as a, a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. No faith in the Lord. No trust in the Lord. The Lord sought fidelity all he got, for the most part, from Israel was infidelity. They continue, the people of Israel. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. They wanted to be, have fidelity toward Pharaoh and the Egyptians, not toward Yahweh. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in this wilderness. Moses, God, you brought us out here in this desert to die. It would have been better for us to stay in Egypt where we would have eaten good. We'd have had houses. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still or be quiet and see the salvation, the deliverance of the Lord which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, their chariots and their cavalry and their army, you shall see them again no more forever. They're about to check out the bottom of the Red Sea without any scuba gear. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And you know, it's God's plan that's important. Not our own. These people had an agenda. They wanted to go back to Egypt into bondage. That wasn't God's plan. If, if you fight against God's plan, prepare to lose. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? This being plural for Israel. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Stop complaining. Where is your faith? Where is your fidelity? But lift thou up thy rod, he continues to Moses, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Moses would stretch forth his hand and deliver Israel out of bondage to Egypt. I can't help but think about Jesus Christ stretching forth his hands on the cross as they were nailed to that cross, uh, delivering us from our sins. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, 
and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. God is in control. The Egyptians are about to learn that. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, the purpose. When I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. You know the rest of that uh, events, the history that go into that. It came to pass just like God told Moses it would come to pass. But when the Israel went across on dry land, the Egyptians followed them. What happened? God caused the walls of the Red Sea to come crashing down, just like the walls of Jericho came crashing down on the enemy. The Song of Moses is a witness for God against his unfaithful children. I see many of you are already turning to Deuteronomy 32. I'm glad you know where the Song of Moses is. Deuteronomy 32. The song that those who overcome the Antichrist, God's election, will be singing as it's written in, in Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. They'll be singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. We're going to not do the whole psalm, but I want to pick it up in verse 15. So, uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. That's probably better translated. The, the Hebrew word is abba. It means to be dense. It's more of a, a mental than a physical description. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteem the rock, notice the capital R, of his salvation. Jeshurun, for those of you who don't know, was a pet name that God had for Israel when they were fat, dumb, and sassy. When things were going good, when things were going good, we as people have a tendency to take credit for it ourselves. Look how great I am. Look what I did with my two hands. Then when things go bad, Oh, God, why did you do this to me? It's all, all of a sudden, it's not God who gave you the good life. It's God who brought the misfortune upon you. Don't let the only time God hears from you be when you're in a time of misfortune. Remember to thank him when things are going good. But they lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. That means they turned, they snubbed their nose at his deliverance. Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior. They provoked him to jealousy. Exodus 34, 14. God's name is Jealous, and that's Jealous with a capital J. With strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Beware of new religions. New religions that teach Easter is a big uh, Sabbath where they go out and roll their eggs in the groves like the heathen, Ishtar. It's called the, the spring uh, festival, if you will. An orgy, as, as it states in the uh, uh, dictionary. Verse 18. Of the rock, capital R, that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and has forgotten God that formed thee. Many today have forgotten God Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11, Moses warned the people of the danger of forgetting God. Common today. Don't care until things are going bad. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. 
because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Their behavior would bring about punishment. Today, many will worship the Antichrist when he returns. You think that's going to please God? Of course not. It's going to provoke him to anger. And he said, I will hide my face from them, and I will see what their end shall be. When God hides his face from you, beloved, you're in a world of hurt. What this means is, I'm going to hide from Israel and see what their outcome is without me. For they are a very froward generation. This means stubborn or perverted. Children in whom is no faith. No fidelity to our Father. No faith in Him. No belief in Him. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. A vanity you could think of as a nothingness or a worthlessness. And I will move them to jealousy. Moffat translates this. They have moved me to jealousy. And those which are not a people, I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Verse 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. God is a consuming fire and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Mountains always symbolic of nations. <clears throat> this hasn't happened yet. It, it will. It's in the future. You can read about it in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, where it states that the elements will be consumed by fervent heat. That means the evil rudiments will be consumed by the consuming fire, our Heavenly Father. Verse 23, I, God speaking, will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. His arrows don't miss. They shall be burnt with hunger. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. The famine of the end time is not for food or water, it's for hearing the word of God. The famine is on. And devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction, I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. Even that old serpent, as he's called in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, the devil. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, male or female, doesn't matter. The suckling, that's a, a, an infant, also with the man of gray hairs, the young infant or the old man. There is no immunity except truth to the deception of Antichrist. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among, in, among men. Israel today, most don't have a clue who they are. And God said, you do things my way, I'll gather you from the nations where I have scattered you. You don't do things my way, I'll scatter you from one end of the earth to the next. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy. This is a poor translation. God doesn't fear the wrath of anyone, including Satan. What this is saying is, I would have done this to Israel, but I'm afraid that the enemy would boast that it was their power that did it. Lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely. Unless they should say, our hand is high or exalted, and the Lord hath not done all this. They would take credit for the harm done to Israel at God's hand. For they are a nation void of counsel. 
Neither is there any understanding in them. There is no understanding or wisdom without God. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider uh, their latter end. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their rock, capital R, Jesus Christ, had sold them or redeemed them better, and the Lord had shut them up. With Christ, we have the victory, we have the authority. For their rock, small r, their rock is the king of Tyre, as it's written in Ezekiel chapter 28. He's already sentenced to die uh, from ashes, turn, turn to ashes from within. For their rock is not our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Even the enemies know that we have different rocks. Too bad most of my children don't, the Lord speaking. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venomous asps. Asp is a snake, a serpent. Is not this laid up in store with me, the Lord speaking, and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2, Luke 4, 18, that gap verse. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And recompense, their foot shall slide in due time. Many will worship the Antichrist. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Verse 36, the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he, being God, shall say, Where are their gods, small g, their rock, small r, in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices? Did, did they sacrifice to me, the Lord speaking? No, they, they sacrificed to a rock or a stick. They were infidels and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. You sacrifice to them. Why are you asking me to protect you and deliver you? Go ask those rocks and sticks that you worship to. Those fake gods, small g, that you worshiped. Ask them to deliver you. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me, no God except me. I will and I, will, I kill and I make alive. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Fear not those who can kill the flesh body, but cannot kill the soul. Fear him who can destroy both the flesh body and the soul in hell. There's only one entity, it's your heavenly father. I wound and I heal, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. God doesn't fear anyone, uh, and he does as he wishes. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Do you want to live forever? Well, as you know, there is only one way. If I wet my glittering sword, Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, the tongue of Christ is that two-edged sword that cuts both ways. And mine hand take hold on judgment. I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. Remember in Deuteronomy 31, 19, we learned that the song of Moses, the song that you're reading here, was written as a witness against God's children that are unfaithful to him. 
That's the reason you, God's elect, will be singing the song of Moses, is a witness telling the people, this is where you went wrong. You didn't worship God. You didn't have faith in him. You worshiped the Antichrist. And that's the reason this recompense or, or payment, repayment, is coming upon you. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. The next verse concludes the Song of Moses. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will re render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land. That's Zion, Jerusalem, and to his people. God loves all of his children. He may or may not love what they're doing, but he indeed loves his children. Hezekiah was a very righteous king of Judah. Hezekiah knew that fidelity to the Lord solves a lot of problems. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 12, as we continue our study on fidelity. Chapter 30, verse 1, And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. Now the interesting thing about this is that the nation had split. The ten northern tribes weren't under the reign of Hezekiah, but he's still calling out to them to, to come to their senses. You see, the 10 northern tribes, many of them had gone into captivity to the Assyrian. And Hezekiah will point that out. But things aren't just going bad in Israel. They're going bad in Judah as well. For being such a righteous king as Hezekiah was, his father Ahaz was arguably one of the worst kings of Judah. He set up altars on every corner in Jerusalem. He had uh, male phallic symbols in the temple of God. He eventually shut the temple of God. First thing Hezekiah did was reopen the temple. For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. Now that is uh, According to the law, very doable. The reason, uh, Numbers chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, if a nation or the people, even an individual, was in an unclean state, they were not to keep the Passover in the first month, Abib, on the, the Hebrew calendar, but uh, rather Er, which is the second month of the Hebrew calendar. That also applied if someone was on a far travel. In other words, traveling to a nation of the heathens that didn't celebrate the Passover. He was expected to celebrate the Passover in the second month on his return. But the, the, the priest sanctified themselves. They cleansed themselves before they started uh, decontaminating, if I can use that word, the, the temple but they became defiled by all the filth that Ahaz and his had brought into the temple. So they were in an unclean state. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently. Neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation, the decision to hold it in the second month. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba, in the extreme 
uh, south, even to Dan, the extreme north, all of it, in other words, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel in Jerusalem, for they had not done it for a long time in such sort as it was written. So the post went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah. These posts or runners, they're called uh, Kirathites and Pelathites in other places. They're also called the executioners of the king. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they were responsible for executing a convicted criminal. It means that they were responsible for executing the wishes of the king. And according to the commandments of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. We're the same bone of bone and flesh of flesh. He's appealing to you. And he will return to the remnant of you, those of you who haven't been taken captive by the Assyrian, that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. Note the plural kings of Assyria. First was Tilgath Pileser, 2 Kings chapter 15. Uh, then came Shalmaneser. Uh, in another uh, king of Syria who took more people captive of Israel. And remember, the king of Assyria, too, is a type for the Antichrist. And be not ye like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as you see. Look around. Things are not good. I say to you today, look around. Things are not good. Many of our brothers and sisters have forgotten the Lord. And they're, they're bringing the price upon themselves. Verse 8, Now be ye not stiff-necked or stubborn, as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord. In the Hebrew, this is give the hand. In other words, infidelity to the Lord and enter into his sanctuary. His sanctuary, where is it? It's in Jerusalem, not in some uh, golden calf that's in Dan or uh, uh, Bethel, which Jeroboam set up as places for the, the people of the ten northern tribes to worship. And he hath sanctified forever, and served the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. The curses or the blessings. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. The choice is yours, even unto this day. You can do things God's way and receive his blessings. You can go against his way and receive his cursings. For if ye turn again unto the Lord your brethren and your children shall be have compassion before them that lead them captive. In other words, those that have already been carried away in exile uh, to Assyria will find favor with their captors. So that they shall come again unto this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. Solomon prayed this at the dedication of the temple. Uh, chapter 6, verse 24 and 25 of the same uh, chapter, the same book. And God promised in chapter 7, verse 14, that he would do that if the conditions were met. So the post passed from city to city, through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mock them. This is to laugh contemptuously at them. And you know what? You get the same today. 90% of the people that you try and plant a seed of truth with, they're going to laugh at you. But you know what? That's okay. 
That's, that's the end of your responsibility, is planting the seed. It's up to God to make that seed germinate and grow. Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. You know what? That's why we work so hard to pull every single one of our brothers and sisters that we can out of the fire. I, I don't care if you plant a hundred seeds and only one of them germinates and grows. It's worth it because you have pulled one of your brothers or sisters from the fire. Also in Judah, the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king of the princes and of the princes by the word of the Lord. I think Hezekiah here is referring to Psalm 133, which is a psalm of degrees, a psalm written by David, who definitely understood the importance of unity of the people. David wrote it when he was returning from exile on the east side of Jordan at the time of Absalom's rebellion. As I said in the introduction, there comes a day in our future where it's extremely important for especially God's elect to maintain their fidelity to the Lord. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we're going to pick it up with verse 1. And it reads, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. This is in Jerusalem. And keep your eyes on what's going on in Jerusalem. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Question. Verily, or truly, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. This is referring to when God will cleanse Jerusalem after the time the Antichrist has polluted the city. Some would have you believe that this happened in 70 AD when a Roman general by the name of Titus attacked and burned uh, quite a bit of Jerusalem. But the Wailing Wall stands to this day. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? That's the subject, the second coming of Christ, the second advent and of the end of the world. Many read that verse and they start shaking in the knees. The world's going to come to an end. That's not what it means. The, the word world is aeon in the Greek. It means a, an age, a period of time. And when one period of time ends, what happens? Another period of time begins. That's the, the, the sections of time that we have seven of in the Bible. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. I encourage you, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You know, a lot of the pulpits that should be teaching God's Word today, Satan is utilizing those pulpits, teaching the rapture, setting people up to be deceived, teaching that Easter is the high Sabbath, and we're going to go out and roll our Easter eggs in the grove with the heathens. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Put your boots on, folks. It's, it's going to get bad, is what this is saying. And these are the beginning of sorrows, the labor pangs of a new age. Then shall they deliver you, that's God's elect, up to be afflicted. They shall kill you. <clears throat> They're going to deliver you up to Satan, the devil, who has the power of death. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That's a good thing to be hated for the name of Jesus Christ. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another in the name of religion, in the name of family. As it's written in Mark 13, many will be delivered up by their own family member. You don't, you don't understand. This, this brother of mine has been studying with these kooks uh, the, that cult down there in Arkansas. And you, you, you got to help him. And they're going to be telling the Antichrist, here's one of God's elect. Deliver him up. That's okay. We can handle it. We will remain, uh, maintain our fidelity to the Lord. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Just as in the days of Jeremiah and Isaiah the false prophets were saying, you don't have to listen to this prophet of God, Jeremiah or Isaiah. Everything's fine. We're not gonna, you're not going into captivity. Everything's okay. Everything's not okay. And you have false prophets today teaching uh, prosperity, peace. All you have to do is believe. I say believe in what? All you have to do is be saved. Be saved by who? The Antichrist? And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The love of many for God and the Lord will wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. If you're one of God's elect, you're going to participate in the first resurrection Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. The seventh trump sounds. Jesus returns. You instantly go into that spiritual body. Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. Then ye therefore shall see the abominations, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Well, where, where did Daniel speak of that? Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13. He's called Lucifer there. And he said, I'm going to establish my throne on the north side of the Temple Mount. Only one problem. That's God's side. That's where God's throne will be established. Antichrist is going to advance himself to be equal to God. He's going to attempt to. Many people will be deceived. Then let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. If you're one of God's elect, get out of Dodge until you are delivered up. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. No time when the desolator appears. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Get out of Judea. The Lord will provide your needs. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. That verse throws a lot of people. 
You mean we're not supposed to have babies before Christ returns? No, that's not what this is talking about at all. You got to think spiritually to understand this. Who's the bridegroom? Jesus Christ. He's been away 2,000 years. Let me ask you, if he returns and his bride is nursing a baby, what does that mean? It means she's been unfaithful. She hasn't maintained her fidelity to God. Woe unto those that are nursing a baby when Christ returns. That means they're already spiritually in bed with Satan. But pray ye, your flight be not in winter. Don't be harvested out of season. Neither on the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day, your travel would be very, very limited. The distance that you could go. For then shall be great tribulation. We quoted this verse in the introduction. Such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. Again, that hasn't happened yet, but it will. The Antichrist is coming. And note, there's nothing said here about flying away. We're going to be here. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. We're going to wrap this up with Paul's teaching in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul was very concerned about God's children having fidelity toward him. 2 Corinthians verse 11, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 1, and it reads, Would to God, or I wish to God, ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband. I've, I've engaged you or married you to one husband. We talked about who that husband was, Jesus Christ, in Matthew 24. That I pre may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Not one who, when he returns, finds nursing an infant giving suck. Not one of the five of the ten virgins who didn't have enough oil in their lamps. Matthew chapter 25. What happened? Those who had oil went into the wedding feast. The other five came knocking on the door. Lord, Lord, let us in. He said, get out of my sight. I don't know you. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve. That's the word beguiled in the Greek. Many of you know it. It's exapatio. It means one thing. Holy seduced. Paul said, I fear that as the serpent in the Garden of Eden, let me clarify, beguiled, wholly seduced Mother Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4 to conclude. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, or a golden calf, or an Ishtar, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. You might swallow it, hook, line and sinker. It's going to happen, beloved. And, you know, many would say, well, how come it hasn't happened yet? Well, 
It happens on God's schedule. It happens when he says, not when we say. It's, it's his will that's important. I don't care how much stuff hits the fan or how hard the stuff hits the fan. I, I, I've got to ask, can I say that? Uh, you, how many of you understand, if you would raise your hand if you understand exactly what I meant when I say the stuff hit the fan. Uh, I dare say 99% of the people got it. And, and I don't care how hard the stuff hits the fan. When it does, you remember the simplicity that is Jesus Christ. That, that's the word. Don't be taken hook, line, and sinker by a false prophet. You know, the rewards of remaining, uh, f having fidelity to the Lord are awesome. You, you can't imagine what it's going to be like in the, the kingdom. The punishment for not remaining fidelity, having fidelity to the Lord is awful. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for your word that tells us how to be pleasing to you, Father, that, that tells us the simplicity of Jesus Christ. It is so simple, your word, Father, that a child can understand it. Although many today try to make it complicated, it's not, Father, and we thank you for giving us eyes and ears to see. I guess the word is complicated for those who don't have eyes and ears to see. Uh, we thank you, Father, for giving us eyes and ears to see. We thank you for those who have come forward to be baptized today, Father, uh, to join the family. Uh, we're always uh, careful to give you the, the credit, the glory, Father. Uh, we ask that everything we do the rest of this day be a reflection of the love that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. I'll point out once again, uh, the, God will pour His Spirit out on His sons and daughters. Uh, they, they will both prophesy. George from Arkansas, I would like to continue to receive the newsletter. Okay, I'm sure that was taken care of. I have one question. Do you know if there is anywhere in God's Word that speaks of this technology today. Do you think it is good? Well, you know, technology can be used for good. Technology can be used for bad. So, George, it kind of depends on, on what the technology is being utilized for. Uh, technology helps us reach many, many people uh, with God's Word. Uh, unfortunately, that same technology uh, spreads a lot of other uh, trash throughout the, the earth, pornography, for example. So it depends on what the technology is used. Um, you know, in, in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus was teaching, and he said, you know, he that believes on me, the works I do, he shall also do an even greater works than those that I do. Now, today we push a button 
and with God's word go into millions of homes. So uh, we believe in, in Jesus Christ and he was right. Uh, with technology, we can do greater works. We can reach more people than what he was able to reach uh, without technology. Mary in Wisconsin, I was told by someone that if a person is not baptized, they will not go to heaven. I believe you were told incorrectly. Uh, many incorrectly teach that John chapter 3 verse 5 states that unless a person is born of water, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. Uh, they take that born of water to mean baptism. I don't believe that it means baptism. I believe that it means to be born in the flesh. Uh, what's the first happen thing that happens before a child is born? The woman's, the mother's water breaks. That's born of water. As opposed to the fallen angels who refuse to be born of women. Irene in Virginia. I heard a pastor on TV say the devil has a wife. Your thoughts on this, please. Well, spiritually speaking, we are all the bride of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, when Jesus returns, many are going to be spiritually in bed with Antichrist, meaning they're going to be deceived. Uh, they won't be virgin brides, uh, the, the virgin bride that Jesus is hoping for. I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You don't want to be in Babylon. You don't want to be in confusion and you study God's Word to show yourself approved. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.